Good evening, everyone, my students, and also the few members of the general audience who've made it till tonight's lecture. I am Anais van Ertvelde. I am the coordinator of Studium Generale, and I'm very delighted to see you all here for what is already our ninth lecture in the Studium Generale series on endings. Our next lecture, unfortunately, will be cancelled because of personal reasons. So after tonight, there is only one more lecture in the series. And that's a lecture by Naima Charkawi, which will take place here in the Midi Concertsaal on the 30th of April. And Naima will tell us about our current awful murderous border system and why and how we could change that or end it. All very welcome to that lecture. For tonight, we welcome Olga Bishka. She will give us a lecture of about 50 minutes. Olga is a historian at the European University Institute in Florence, but she's also so much more. She's a journalist, a playwright, a feminist and queer activist. And afterwards, she'll have a conversation with Jonas van der Schuur. I think we'll have about 40 minutes for that conversation. And who is Jonas? Well, Jonas is a postdoctoral fellow at Leuven University, specializing in Polish theater, culture, and performance. Afterwards, there will be some time for questions from the audience. It might be good to know, know for you all that the evening is being recorded. So if you want to ask a question, make sure you have the microphone. Me or my colleague Helena will be making the rounds with the microphones. And wait with speaking before you have the microphone in your hands. Turn it on also. And it might be also good for you to know that the evening is being recorded. There are no cameras pointed towards you. They're all pointed towards the uh, towards the stage, but make sure if you ask a question, it might be recorded as well. Also on stage tonight is Katrien, our wonderful sign language translator, who will make the evening a bit more accessible for all. And then I think there's nothing left for me to do, but to ask you for a warm round of applause and welcome to the stage, Olga Bishka. Good evening, everybody. Um, this feels strangely like a TED talk. Uh, TED talk about Poland, explain Poland, or Poland, why so complicated. Uh, and this is also pretty, it feels pretty vulnerable because I will tell you the story of Poland, why so complicated, also using my life as, a, as an example. So, so it's, uh, it feels very, um, nope, that doesn't work, ah, yeah, this time. Uh, that it feels, uh, it feels very particular, because even though I'm, I'm a theater writer and writer in general, um, and I teach people mostly your age from what I can see, um, it, it is different kind of talk, uh, so, I won't start with a corny joke like at TEDx, but I will uh, start with uh, 1991. Again, will I? So, this is 1991. The Gulf War had just begun and the silence of the lambs has just come out. Um, who died that year? Freddie Mercury, Miles Davis, Serge Gainsbourg. But not only that. Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, all those countries declared the independence from the USSR. And soon, soon enough, there was no more USSR. In the same year, uh, newly democratic Poland was taking its first steps with the new government elected in the first partly democratic elections and with a new president, Lech Wałęsa. Um, the pace of changes in politics and the economy was, has picked up as well. The military presence of the Soviet Union uh, and its forces in Poland was mostly withdrawn. Poland established 
diplomatic relations with most of the Western European states. And the Warsaw Stock Exchange opened for the first time in 52 years. So just before World War II, actually. Well, I was born in uh, 7th of October, 1991. 7th of October isn't that great of a date. Not only looking at the last year, but also the fact that I share my birthday with Vladimir Putin, of all people. <laughs> well, this is not something I have any power over, but karma. Um, but I was born only 20 days before the first fully democratic elections in Poland since 1930. Our lives, mine and Poland's, go hand in hand in a way. My singular existence and the family setup, all the challenges and factors that shaped me as I'm here, um, are nothing but a mirror, a prism, if you will, of the structural changes the, this country has been undergoing for over past three decades. Our generation, my generation, the generation of those born on the verge of regime changes, embodies all the societal paradigm shifts of that time. We draw from the experiences of generations before, our parents, our grandparents, those generations who lived through real socialism, but we do not know any other world than the one we were born into, the world of liberal democracy and capitalist economy. So Poland and I are millennials, but we are also strange millennials. Um, it is this strange transient generation between those two very different, hard to combine political regimes and economic regimes. Because on the one hand, we encompass all the experiences and attitudes of people living in the previous political regimes, either through the memories and attitudes of people living in the previous regime, or habits such as, in particular, for instance, um, a, some kind of uh, disdain towards political party affiliation. Very few of people of my generation would ever enter po political party because we were always told that somebody who belongs to a political party is a little bit suspicious. On the other hand, um, our lives have been defined and shaped by all the changes unfolding after the 1991 and 98, 90, uh, 1989 regime change. So, we were children during the currency transition, the hyperinflation, the mass layoffs of millions of workers in places that were deemed completely unnecessary in the new capitalist Poland. We were barely teenagers when the country became a member of the European Union in 2004. We started adulthood just as the consequences of the 2008 economic crisis hit home. Finally, my generation of Polish millennials lived through almost a decade of rule by the populist, illiberal Law and Justice Party. Many of us uh, started their families despite the government's increasingly aggressive policies towards certain groups of people, uh, both inside and outside of Poland. Inside may be queer people, refugees, sometimes artists, sometimes scientists. The conference that they co-organized in Paris in 20, early 2019 has even its Wikipedia page and was a hero of not only the uh, main um, public TV uh, evening news, but we also became an object of a meme. So I think that once you become an object of the meme, you know that you made it in life. Um, but 
you can say that the history of this new post-1991 Poland, its democratic ascent and its decline, and this strange limbo-like period that we now find ourselves in um, after the change of the governing party, these are simply parts of our bodies. This recent change of government, a liberal democratic coalition replacing an illiberal party for the first time in, since uh, 2015. And this particularly tense and unpredictable situation triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine all these situations and structures overlap with our own internal conflicts and struggles. So many of us, 30 and early 40 year olds, feel prompted to ask ourselves new questions regarding our future on both individual and collective levels. So this is the exhibit one, my first birthday and three generations of women. My grandmother, born in December 1947, in a village 25 kilometers from Warsaw, with over 2,000 inhabitants. Being in this village, even in my childhood, felt not like you were only 20 kilometers from Warsaw, but rather 200 kilometers from Warsaw. She left school, aged 12, worked in a screw factory, tended to the family field, met my grandfather, who worked at the time at the railway. My mother, born in 1968, was also born in the, in the same nearby village. In 1973, my family moved to a new working class neighborhood of north of Warsaw, it's called Brudno, as you can see here. My grandfather received a 38 square meter flat, the flat that I grew up in, and the one that you could see in this picture. Uh, and it was a package deal with a new job on a state agricultural farm. This is precisely what it was. My mother went to a vocational school that would not give her a kind of high school diploma, but would rather instead train her in a particular profession. And regime change of 1989 would find her as a sales girl in a shop on the other better side of Warsaw, because in each city there are better and worse parts of the town, right? Um, so people who did not live here, this is where I grew up. This could be, even though I found it on the internet, this could have been as well a photo from my childhood flat, uh, the key place, uh, a park. So this was a completely parallel universe to the better war, so and people who did not live there had actually absolutely no reason to go there. Meanwhile, those who lived there, myself included, till I was a teenager, most of them, like generation of my parents and grandparents, they didn't have much time or energy to spare to venture out of the city center to the city center, uh, except to access the services of goods that were by chance unavailable in local markets or the blossoming retail out in the streets in the 90s. Because you see, the 1990s, and specifically the first half of this decade, uh, were a terra incognita for the Polish capitalism. If you had a network, if you had an uncle abroad, the right material somewhere in your cupboard, or just an idea, or if you knew a Western language, if you were well organized, or just entrepreneurial or savvy, you could create a business that would start out as, as a cardboard stunt, literally here and now, 
with some clothes only to become a clothing giant within two, three years. Large scale fortunes or many stratospheric careers were made in those early years of the new Poland if you happen to be the right person in the right place in the right time. The spoils went to those in better of areas who knew when to take a risk, how to work the new jobs, and with whom. For other people, like those from less fortunate areas of Brudno, the 1990s hit quite differently. Most of the factories in the area called Zerań, as pictured, in 1999, and 2003. These uh, factories underwent many structural changes, were sold and bought here and there. Um, and those changes often included, surprise, surprise, layoffs. The unemployment rate all that time oscillated stubbornly around 15%, a situation which encouraged development of shadow markets of drugs and stolen car parts. Hmm, interesting. But the biggest problems were the drug abuse and quite rampant alcoholism. The Polish heroin, a crude drug known in the country since the 1970s, became a much bigger problem in large housing districts, such as ours, in, after 1989. So as a kid, because our flat is on the ninth floor out of the ten floors, um, as a kid I got used to walking over these semi-unconscious people, high as a kite or blackout drunk, lying on the stairs between the floors in our building because uh, the escalator was just uh, perpetually uh, out of order. So I spent my first decade of life um, between school and the local healthcare clinic where my mother and grandmother worked at the registration desk and as a cleaner respectively. I would follow the wet mop of my grandma asking, answering her questions and questions of just random people who were talking to me because they knew that I was just like six, seven year old girl that was just boring, bored there. Who would I like to be when I grow up? And I would usually say an architect or something like that because being an academic, a historian, writer, it would have never crossed my mind because I didn't know that those could be actual professions. I didn't know that it existed really. In my eight or 10 year old mind, the effect of one's work had to be material, tangible, and easy to spot, such as the little wooden stools made by my grandfather in my grandparents' room. Having those vague, intangible dreams were, was absolutely impossible in the dark corridors of that clinic, marked with the visible footsteps of patients' boots my grandma had not cleaned up just yet. Whereas my parents and their possibilities, limits, and problems have always been closely related to more structural issues. Although obviously they have been responsible for every and each of their choices and they bear the consequences of those. But think about the year 2002, 2003. I'm 11 or 12 years old the unemployment rate in Poland was 20%. And my father disappeared from one day to another for eight months, leaving the entire family with hundreds of thousands of zlotys in debt. These loans, as far as I know, my family is not the most communicative one, um, these loans came mostly from dodgy creditors, many of them so-called express loans, or chwilówki in Polish, with absolutely atrociously high interest rates. So essentially you would borrow 10K and you will have to um, give back like 16K within a week, something that you would only see in the movies. 
And so this uh, payoff amount would constantly inflate. In those years, it was really easy to take out these, these loans. And it was just as easy to end up in a financial spiral. People often feeling forced to take another loan to pay out another one, this first one. And this is how it got. So essentially, really, a spiral downwards. And uh, the complete lack of regulation created a parallel system of physical violence and threats, which in one case uh, included threats to my mother that uh, those people would kidnap me. So I had to stay in my family flat uh, for one week, uh, not going to, to the primary school. Oftentimes, people who suffered similar problems to those of my family resorted to taking their own life. That was the price some paid um, in this a bit all too free market. And these issues plaguing not only my parents' generation, but us, because we bore all those consequences, were addressed by popular culture in movies such as The Dead, uh, Dwóg from 1999, Hi Teresa, Cześć Tereska from 2001, 2000 actually. Fun fact, the director is a brother of a former Ministry of Culture of Law and Justice Party. And that was actually a very good movie. Um, and then Savior's Square uh, from 2006. Uh, Dwok is based actually on, on real life events. And it tells the story of two young businessmen who are offered help from, you know, friend of a friend to facilitate getting a loan to open their own factory. But during the negotiations for the loan, um, they eventually declined this offer. And yet this person that was initially helping them starts demanding repayment of a completely non-existent debt which ultimately, as you might expect, leads to a murder. Cześć Tereska, with two main roles played by amateur actresses uh, from a corrective uh, facility, um, is the story of a teenage girl from another big post-Soviet bloc complex in Warsaw. And it's about uh, her trajectory in a gradually isolating and violent environment. Finally, Plaza Pavicella, the Savior's Square, is the story of a young couple who took out a mortgage for a flat in a building still under construction and the consequences they faced when confronted with the developer's bankruptcy and toxic family situation. These films all discuss the dark, and ruthless side of young Polish capitalism and the inevitable defeat of so many individuals engaged in it. And the truth is that only in the past 15 years has a public discussion of the lack of regulations within Polish capitalism has been properly conducted. Slowly, juridical solutions such as personal bankruptcy have been introduced. Um, this tool, which is a form of uh, debt relief for individuals, kind of parallel to the form of, uh, that most of companies who fly for bankruptcy undergo, was only introduced in 2009. In recent years, many hundreds of thousands of people have submitted bankruptcy cases to courts involving prominent well-established banks as well because just before the 2008 crisis, banks in Poland convinced borrowers to take a mortgage and pay off their monthly loans in Swiss francs instead of zlotys, um, a setup that was particularly beneficial for financial institutions. But after the crash, the Swiss franc currency's rate went up twofold. And a big part of the middle class in the making 
was left with loans significantly exceeding the initial cost of their possessions, and there was no institutional support. Only in the past five years have courts started issuing rulings favoring these clients' claims, which largely showed that banks were not informing borrowers of the risk of taking such loans. But of course, the past 30 years have brought immensely positive changes to Poland as well. This is the success story that makes us proud, particularly when abroad. And this is the version of a story that most people abroad know from the press. The country's success is represented through various indications, such as GDP, which has grown over 900% since 1980. Oh. All this is the GDP that just steadily grew. Market growth, purchasing power parity, all those indicators were just, they just skyrocketed. These indicators show Poland's fast ascent into one of the most significant European economies, even after the financial 2008 crash. One can add to it the efficient cooperation with the European Union after our joining in 2004, until, of course, the law and justice came to power in 2015. And I'm also the example of a success story because after all, I'm speaking to you in English and, you know, trying to explain this success story and try to make it a little bit more ambiguous to you. And it's thanks to education because my educational path fell during two decades of this mostly staggering growth and its consequences. Throughout primary, secondary, and high school, I experienced also many of those paradoxes related to structural changes of the country. On the one hand, the local primary and secondary schools, located just a couple of minutes of walk away from where I lived, um, were traditionally ranked as the lowest in all the city when it came to educational rankings, but quite high up when it came to sports performance and uh, dangerous situations on the brakes. I can recall at least a couple of fights that ended up with you know, broken noses and people in the hospitals. But on the other hand, thanks to many engaged, experienced and really excellent teachers, I received an excellent education which later proved to be just as good as that of people from wealthier parts of Warsaw and better schools. Some of the teachers' support went way beyond their, just their teaching subjects, and I will not exaggerate in saying that they changed my life, telling me about high schools and places that I didn't know existed. And all those places were only, you know, 20 or 30 minutes away from me. The elite school, the elite high school I was lucky to get into, on the other hand, was nothing but my first real experience of a class distinction. A realization that came upon me a couple of years after I graduated and tried to understand the reasons behind my feeling miserable there. I just couldn't fit, you know? And as a 15-year-old in 2006, I co couldn't really understand why. It was only later, after dropping out of my first university degree, that I had enough time and maybe maturity huh, to reflect upon the stark differences between me and the rest of my classmates. Most of them were coming from the middle of upper middle class, the first generation of people who made it in the early Polish capitalism of the 90s. These lucky people traveled for the summer and winter holidays abroad, rode horses, played tennis, their parents were successful entrepreneurs or had senior positions in newly created branches of foreign corporations. Our daily life experiences were vastly different. As different were our possibilities for growth and development, had such different starting points. 
we, the generation born around 1989-1992, were likely the first generation in the newly democratic Poland to experience such a clear class distinction in a domestic context, as opposed to the distinctions we had always faced when compared with the so-called West. The early adulthood of our generation started in parallel with the consequences of, of 2008 financial crisis, and while its aftershocks seemed to barely touch Poland, so much so that the country was named a beacon of resi resilience in Europe, as I showed here and here. It was largely because of these neoliberal policies of the then governing civic platform that the illiberal Law and Justice Party was able to gain enough support to win the elections in 2015. Yay. Civic Platform's rejection of these solving fundamental social issues resulted in elevating the far-right Law and Justice Party to power. Civic Platform's capitalist policies created an opening for them. How, for instance, and again, this is the example from my family's life. How do you care? Uh, how do you take care of your mother suffering from Alzheimer's while more and more of your time and effort is spent working on an infinite chain of temporary contracts which paid at that time only eight zlotys, two euros per hour? Before 2015, no minimum hourly wage for temporary contracts even existed. Stories of people dying from spending too many hours at work became well known and well publicized. Child benefits, the introduction of which was blocked for a long time by the civic platform, um, did indeed happen during the first law and justice term. And somehow the Polish economy withstood that shock. Thousands of people working in public services who had had their salaries frozen in 2010 got their raises for the first time in six years in 2016. So the Law and Justice Party, however illiberal, did indeed solve some problems in the new Polish capitalism, which Civic Platform had been just unwilling to confront. And I shared this discontent at the time, not only because of my family and their struggles, but I also because of my own. Without any support, I had tried to find a way to study full-time while working nearly full-time to avoid living in my family flat because those 38 square meters shared by five adults had created completely unlivable circumstances for a 19-year-old girl like me. I worked for a couple of months in a pharmaceutical warehouse, waking up at four, like 20 past 4 a.m. So many sunrises seen, never again. I also worked as a part-time assistant to the CEO of a small company, and I was responsible for everything, from planning foreign trips to moving out the unused tires from her car's trunk. I even tried to write freelance for very little money, money which would always arrive too late. Freelancers here know what I'm talking about. I couch surfed from one friend's flat, floor or sofa to another, and I would come to the classes in my first year of theater school with a backpack, toothbrush, and fresh change of clothes in it, not really knowing sometimes where I would stay. Had it not been for the generosity of all the people around me, which would probably make another lecture on its own, I would have probably had to drop out of those stu studies too. And probably that was the reason, along with the first proper breakup, I mean, you're 21, uh, that made me emigrate to France in 2013. At that time, I just could not see my future improving and I knew I needed to try something else somewhere else. And while that first year spent in Paris, working two jobs, learning the language, trying to make sense of my existence, did not bring a magical solution for all my problems. I was still able to return to Poland to finish my BA with some kind of newfound sense of agency. And even though I have been a social democrat for as long as I can remember, and luckily enough, I align with it, with my family because they kept their 
strong common sense of work, working class. I could understand people's frustration with their economic prospects and political indifference under the previous government. However, of course, the nationalistic spin the 2015 elections took, while it was quite predictable, it still brought about changes in Polish democracy that nobody could have predicted in its scope. With certain long-awaited social improvements, such as introducing the monthly child subsidy called 500 plus, the Polish democracy um, took a hit at its core, obviously. The dismantling of the basis of the judicial system resulting in a parallel system of political conduct to the separation of powers from the adopted in 1997 constitution created a major conflict with the European Union. It was a fun day because I was fi a fixer uh, for um, Le Point journalist at the very day when the European Union announced that they will be uh, using this uh, Article 7. Uh, let me tell you, I've never seen so many uh, stressed ministers of law and justice in my life and I will probably never see it again. Worth it though. Um, but hate speech, along with both symbolic and very often also tangible forms of violence, entered daily public discourse and public space. Objects of that hate were various, from political opponents, artists and scientists, to queer people or refugees. The almost total abortion ban was introduced, uh, as were introduced the so-called LGBT free zones that, uh, in fact, as the recent study shows, increased the suicide rate in the country. However, the eight years of illiberal rule via the Law and Justice Party may have also created an atmosphere for Polish democracy to grow and mature, as those protests are show here, until finally hundreds of thousands of people took part in an unprecedented wave of protest fighting for their rights. This is me and one of my closest friends. We did this uh, protest performance that was called Police Look at Yourselves in the Mirror after a particularly hostile wave of police, of, uh, police violence against protesters. So we just had those um, kind of tape that we put uh, and we just kind of marched. There were 500 to 1,000 people that just marched uh, just before the police that just was forced to look at their faces. I'm very proud of that. Um, so new friendships, new alliances were created and as the 75% voter turnout in the last elections showed, Polls largely re-examined their attitude vis-a-vis -vis power, redirecting their frustrations towards more organized, I would hope, forms of political resistance, such as the one just days ago where another protest, this time the, against the current government, and their reticence to vote over liberalization of the current abortion ban took place. But I would like to finish this lecture with a glimmer of hope. Because this year Poland will celebrate 35 years of its new democracy. According to Dante, that was a mid middle age. So even though the geopolitical circumstances of this celebration might, might make it difficult to enjoy, perhaps it is some kind of feeling of many endings that we approach simultaneously, both me and Poland. This first decade and a half of our adulthood has passed. First serious mistakes have been made. Some were fixed, others we must accept. For myself, I am contemplating my near future and which pa path to return, return to Poland, stay abroad, build a life in between, move to Ghent, um, 
join long conducted fights for same sex marriages in Poland, push for a better education system that helped me this much, and push for a better mental health care for young people. And as I contemplate these things, so does all of Poland. As one must reconstruct one's life at times, after moments of structural changes, so does the country. The case of a new Poland is instructive and might, in fact, become a blueprint for the re-democratization of judicial or public media systems that could serve in the future a few other illiberal states looking at you, Hungary. So it feels like an ending, but it might also feel just like a new beginning. Thank you. Is it on? It should be on now. Can you hear me in the hall? Great. Thank you. So first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for this conversation and apologies for the... Uh, you know. And first and foremost, I just wanted to say that um, I already said thank you, but also thank you for making it this personal and really using that positionality and the way that you... Uh, relate to, or rather how you've uh, used your embodied experience growing up in Poland and then um, moving out of Poland and changing your perspective. Um, I think that brings a really interesting perspective on what it means to be Polish today and also how um, questions of democracy and questions of solidarity as well, um, how we can relate to them uh, outside of a Polish context, right? And it also really uh, helps to put a face on the statistics and uh, the very specific framing we usually see in the Western news media definitely reframes it. Mm. Um, so I have a first question for you. Is you, in your talk, and also I think you've been writing an article based on this talk as well, uh, you mentioned that there are many... Um, problems with Polish democracy, and you very specifically focus on uh, the degeneration, the breaking of the social fabric. I wanted to ask, first and foremost, um, has this only been in a negative sense, uh, this breaking down the social fabric? And secondly also, do you see any other like problems or opportunities that arise from these transformations? You mean the transformations of 1989 or transformation now or both? Both. Um, just to, you know, to kind of get, get back to how you started to address this question and the talk. I mean, I, I'm not interested in kind of talking about myself, really, because, I mean, very moving story, but each of us has a story to tell. Um, but I think that, that it's really important to kind of use stories as mine as a vehicle mm -hmm. to understand larger patterns and larger structures. Mm -hmm. And Poland is just such a, we, we, we spoke about that just before, that it's such a niche country, it's just like, it's so complex and sometimes difficult to understand. It's this kind of blank space. Maybe these days a little bit less blank because of what's happening in Ukraine. So coincidentally, Poland has to be somehow also a subject. But usually it's easier to learn Japanese than to learn Polish or any other Slavic country. Or, you know, how much do you know about Slovakia? Or Bulgaria? Or Hungary, apart from Orban, and Budapest has uh, a nice old town and cheap alcohol. Nothing. And so I think that only throughout using 
vehicle as myself, even though I'm not enjoying that particularly, um, because I speak languages, because I know how to talk about that. Uh, I can bring even like 30 people to, to ask themselves some questions that otherwise they wouldn't have ever asked themselves. When it comes to the notions of social fabric and social transformation mm -hmm. in the Polish context, but also in more general context. Again, of course, your positionality creates all the context and it serves as a point of departure to your opinion. Um, because my, the story of my family at the same time is quite hardcore and at the same time, it's not hardcore enough. Um, it's really also kind of, it's in between, you know, being the kind of story that would need as much state support as it mm -hmm. can get, not least because of... Uh, yeah, but in that sense, it's perhaps also more representative of yeah. the ways in which a transformation has yeah. happened. But what, what I came to understand in my 20s, not throughout conversations with my parents, because as I said, not communicative, uh, but throughout my reflection and social studies, all the humanities and arts that eventually help you to understand yourself and where you're from. It's um, that at the same time, because of this kind of weird transformation that was just like from you know, one day to another mm -hmm. with nothing in between. Um, I had more freedom because, of course, from the money perspective and from the perspective of cultural and social capital, I had much less than mm -hmm. other people, even though I lived in the capital. So, you know, we can also create a hierarchy that somebody from a little town somewhere had it worse. You know, there, there's many factors, of course. Um, but I was freer also mm -hmm. to do whatever I liked yeah. because there was no expectations from me. Yeah, you didn't have a feeling you had to like follow some family tradition or... No, I mean, would I become another generation of lawyers? I mean, I was the first one who mm -hmm. finished high school. So like, just I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And you didn't become an architect then, after all? Well, you never know. <laughs> it's um, never too late, that's fair enough. Middle age crisis approaches, you know, maybe instead of Porsche, I will just uh, end up as an architect with my love for brutalism. Um, but yeah, so there's always a trade off, right? There's less expectations, there, there's less family pressure, and then mm -hmm. in high school, but also, you know, like I still live in Paris and. I'm, I'm finishing my PhD at a very particular university, so I can see what, what this kind of generational pressure is and what it does to people mm -hmm. that still just like sometimes don't realize the extent to which. And I'm, I've just, I moved out when I was 16, essentially, with kind of being back and forth like for one night or two from time to time. But once I've done it, I was free. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to being a good woman, it, it's also about that, that, you know, once, once I, I was free, I mean, I don't have to do anything. Like, I'm, I always was different, and my sexual identity was never basis of this mm -hmm. difference. I was just different from the place I was. So I might have been just like, oh, just screw it. I will just do my thing. Mm -hmm. There's many topics here that I would like to return <laughs> back to later in uh, the discussion, but I would like to quickly bring it back to the like second part of the question I asked is, how do you, how do you feel about Polish democracy today? Like, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? I had a feeling both currents were in yeah. your talk in this, and I know from, well, my own experiences and also from other friends and family and so forth, that it's, there's so many complex emotions going on there, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm a historian. Can I be ever an optimist? <laughs> Come on. Also, I'm writing a PhD about the immediate post-World War II, 44, 48, and ideas of reconstruction. So it's great timing. Um, well, maybe... I think, I think that the, 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 the paradox of Poles, if we might generalize mm -hmm. communities and talk about those imagined communities, is that we work well against something, but we don't really work well together when there's nothing to work against. Mm -hmm. So now it might be easier because of the war in Ukraine that there's still this kind of, ooh, ooh, you know, essentially Poland borders with three countries that's, that are involved in this war. Mm -hmm either as, a, as yeah, an invader that's... or as a victim. So one third of the border of our country is with either Russia, Belarus, yeah. and, or Ukraine. One third, imagine this in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, that would basically be the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. Yeah, and a bit yeah. of France. And a little bit of France, yeah. There's some historical precedent there, of course. But yeah. But... <laughs> You're aware of that as a historian. Yeah. <laughs> We don't talk about it here. Um, yeah, but um, I, I think that everybody knows that, that we, uh, we are in a very particular moment and that we might change everything in mm -hmm. that particular moment. Maybe I will, um, because I presume that most of the audience doesn't really know what the current situation is in Poland. Um, yeah, so there was a change of government and since mid-December 2023, we have a new government that consists of civic platform that I mentioned, but also some sort of alliance of both um, left-wing party and uh, Christian democracy. The civic platform has changed quite, quite significantly and also, you know, many things have happened over the past eight years in the world, in Europe, in the region. So they are not as um, uninterested mm -hmm. as they used to be. I think they've learned a couple of their lessons. Not enough still, but still better than it used to be. Um, but I think that people who... Like we... we and by, by us, I mean people who are in the public sphere, but people who are artists, people who are scientists, people who... We... We all wonder what to do and how to kind of work towards just better public space and better institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, not to lose our minds and not to, you know, burn out. Because well, there's just so much to do. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask about that. Is because I think for the past eight years, when you had a right-wing conservative government with peace, in a certain sense, like there's incredible amounts of anxiety involved mm -hmm. living under such a government, right? Especially as queer people, especially as, you know, people from whatever, um, like, I don't want to say minority position, but it is kind of accurate in Polish mm. society, right? Um, like you've mentioned, for example, foreigners, refugees, and so forth. Um, women, <laughs> that's actually not a minority, but I mean, yeah. Minoritized would be yeah. a more correct term to use by uh, hegemonic uh, rhetoric and the way that politics is done. In a sense, that did create a bit of a juxtaposition that was useful for organizing. And you see this, you have Strike Kobiet, for example, mm -hmm. that brings like, I think at one point, 200,000 people in Warsaw, right? Oh, I think that um, there was a moment in 2020 where there was one million people on the street yeah, in Warsaw alone. Ah, yes, okay. Yes. Yeah, at the height. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In November 2020, there was one million people in a city that's of two million people, so as much as in Brussels, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel now that the government has changed, but mm -hmm. many of the structures that uh, either enabled uh, peace to come to power or that enabled it to maintain power or, you know, many of the problems that were there before they came to power and that got worse while they were in power are still there. Yeah. How do you, as like, uh, as an academic, as an artist, as an activist, relate to those uh, types of questions? 
Well, the, the situation is indeed in particular, and it also might serve as a kind of cautionary tale for countries that did not undergo this, maybe yet, let's hope not, just not. But because of all those juridical, uh, juridical changes in particular, we entered some kind of parallel world, parallel universe, because there was the constitution, so there was this kind of, you know, all the basic laws that should be applied to everything else, it was a kind of domino effect. But with all those um, changes, law and justice actually created a parallel judicial system. Mm -hmm. So it is essentially a bit of a mind fuck for people because not only lawyers and experts, because you have to function somehow as a country. It's just such a complex entity. So you kind of, even if you don't want it, you accept it in order to just to function. Mm -hmm. And now there's new government that is trying just to undo all those changes and people start shouting, but this is unlawful, but unlawful according to which law? Like yeah, the one that everybody just yeah. has gotten used to because, you know, things have to happen and life has to get on? Or is it according to the law that was somehow suspended around between 2015 and 2017? And these are precedents mm -hmm. that nobody knows really how to interpret and what to do with. But isn't this actually in some ways, and maybe this is more a question as a historian, yeah. but sim similar to the post-communist transformation, Oh, I no, mean, I think it's you didn't have parallel systems, but you do have a, you know, a very big gap between the way people live their lives and the way that you know, it's supposed to work. I think it's... Um, so, one question is the question of continuity, mm -hmm. right? That essentially you have to keep on remaking, improving, changing the social system and all the institutions in order to adjust to ever-changing historical and social circumstances. But I think in this sense, and again, I'm not talking about magnitude here. Don't, don't interpret it out of the context. Uh, but when it comes to the changes and the, 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 system, the systemic changes, um, I think that that situation is rather that of immediate post-World War II, not only because it's my topic of my PhD, and again, by no means I'm talking about Poland being, you know, mm -hmm. anything like, uh, there, there's no parallels in, in that regard. But when it comes to how to keep continuity of life while also undoing things that were actively destroying people's lives. Mm -hmm. How to, what to do, for instance, with the public television and with public media that essentially served for the past eight years just as a, well, propaganda. Like, there's no other way to talk about it. It was just really... Yeah, it was, it was very pro-government, very explicitly pro-government. Yeah, but to it the extent that was that was really... It was very really, hateful as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, think about Fox News and Donald Trump. I, I think that this is the only parallel yeah. that can, can be served here. And now, like, how do you change the very structure of the public media mm -hmm. with that? And also, what, to, what do you do with people who were, you know, weren't the main faces of this public media. Yeah, but who still worked But still it. worked there. Yeah. The, these, are, these are all those questions, or what do you do with, you know, um, public functioners in the ministries that used to work there for like 25 years, and they were undergoing some hardcore mobbing as well, and they weren't paid enough. Uh, and yet they worked for um, for this government, also sometimes with good intentions to serve the continuity of the institution. Mm -hmm. What do you do, case by case study, like a blanket, 
Like well, the, something like that happened in the 90s, right, with the illustration. That illustration, you know, I think, again, it was more many people who were savvy enough to prepare for it. They just kind of entered new, new special forces, mm -hmm. for instance, or the new police. Uh, essentially, you know, if somebody is prepared well enough, they will always find a place for um, themselves. That's why I make uh, these comparisons yeah. and I ask about it, because as uh, someone, you describe yourself as a social democrat, so someone who's on the left, yeah. someone who's engaged as an activist, you yourself now clearly say that many of these questions are kind of up in the air at the moment. It's yeah. this in-between period where it's unclear what the new society will be and whether the new government will actually be able yeah. to to create a new society, yeah. right? Is how do you prevent the situation from again getting into uh, the state that it was in 2015, right? Yeah. When PIS came yeah. to power, because I mean, yes, things have improved in certain ways. Yeah. When you think about uh, the child credit, when you think about, um, I don't know if it's still the case, but for a while there was a 0% tax rate for people below 25, for example. Yeah, that um, I don't know, I think it's undergoing some changes. Yeah, so I mean, there's all those types of things that in the short term gave people some money in their pockets, but it's very unclear, like, the social problems in Poland are still there, right? Yeah. So, is and there, there any new problems, answer yeah. for that? Um, like, I presume from the government it's very limited, but as an activist, how yeah. do you look at those things? Or as an academic, how do you look at those yeah. things? Or just as, you know, someone who grew up in a working class district, like, do you have any hope there? I know it's a very broad and, and difficult question, but it's also, yeah. I think it goes to the heart of um, yeah. your lecture, right? Well, so I think, again, on the one hand, when I, you know, us old people, we use Facebook still. <laughs> Generation Z and lower, y you guys don't probably. But sometimes I still have, you know, my primary school colleagues, class classmates uh, among my friends, and I see that they have like two or three children uh, already. Like teenage pregnancies, don't get me started. That will be another lecture on itself there. Um, but they bite rather well. And mm -hmm. I think that probably I'm much more precarious than they are, because they would, um, they would probably create some kind of companies or they would just work in some kind of businesses that we would regard mm -hmm. as blue collar ones, but actually they earn much more money than any of us mm -hmm. here. So, I mean, from that point of view, there's like complete disintegration of social capital and just capital yeah. as such. On the other hand, of course, I think that Poland's problems, apart from this particular type of problems, but also the ones that exist in the UK now, in the US, uh, more and more probably in Slovakia, um, Hungary again, mm. I think that we have the same problems, like cost of life. I was going to make a comparison like that, is that many of the issues you talk to, I think, are very relevant also here Absolutely. in Belgium. Um, I mean, anyone who's seen the opinion polls knows what is most likely coming uh, in the second half of the year. And um, yeah, it's like piss, turbo piss, I would say. It's, yeah. uh, not very promising, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly envious of your situation <laughs> oh. or most of the Western countries now because I feel like we've, we've gone through this mm -hmm. and of course we are still on the verge of kind of slipping back into that but I think that we, we know very well why. Mm -hmm. no, but no, no matter which side you are on and also of course there are no just like very clear differences but then when you actually ask people what do they want, well everybody wants to pay less for food. Everybody mm -hmm. wants more social housing. No matter whether this is Brussels, Ghent, Warsaw, Paris, Vienna, if there are problems with social housing in Vienna now, when then the Europe is yeah, that's, gone. Yeah, that's fair enough, yeah. Uh, so so I, think, I think that 
what's a problem, both in Poland, and this is something I've always had a problem with, but also in general, and something that I guess we can all relate to, is the, that our political leaders do not confront issues. Mm -hmm. They just try to kind of avoid them, because for certain amount of years or decades maybe even, the politics became performative. Like the, the very goal of becoming a politician is to have power for the sake of having power. Not in order to introduce any changes, but in order to win yet another election. And there's nothing behind it. Mm -hmm. It's pure void. So no wonder there's populism or post-truth or whatever, because there's nothing there, which means that everything can be put in mm -hmm. there. Well, but that's exactly why I'm trying to gauge a little bit your thoughts on you've, because in Poland, you've had this moment of like right-wing institutional capture yeah. and where like um, peace in the first election won an absolute majority. Yeah. That's how they managed to do many of these things is that they won an election with only 37% of the vote <laughs> and somehow end up with a parliamentary majority and thank you. Um, yeah. Is you've managed at least to and I'm talking very broadly here about Polish yeah. society, has at least managed in a way to kick out in a very short, like a very immediate term, piss from power and has now this chance. And that's why I'm very curious at like, potentially the beginning of a similar moment here. How can you like change um, those behaviors of politicians? Because obviously from the oh. perspective of an activist, right? Yeah. There's some form of like, how do you build political counterpower? Because, and I say this, of course, with a specific reason, I personally find it very interesting the way in which uh, mm -hmm. you had a pro-abortion movement arise yeah. in Poland and the way that it was able to mobilize so many people. Do you think maybe that? Uh... I think that ultimately there's only one answer, and this is not the answer that I like, mm -hmm. but it's to enter politics. Do you mean and party then, politics by that? I don't know. I don't know. I think that we need some new forms of politics. Whatever this is, I don't think we, we are yet there to know what kind of new politics we need. We can see some kind of, you know, bits and pieces in it in those kind of flexible collective forms mm -hmm. that are on, in between kind of social activism, social protests, opposition social pressure, but we need to enter politics. But then, each of us here probably is not really fond of this idea because eventually it's about, do I want to dedicate my life to this? Mm -hmm. Do I want to spend my all energy, resources, time to try to make something better? But then, of course, there are many facets of this politics, right? Mm -hmm. like you well, yeah, and you're also as an individual engaging with a system that you yeah. don't necessarily have the power to change. Yeah, I'm trying to convince myself or I'm trying to save myself from entering politics because I'm, I know that I'm good at this, for instance, so making people, at least 10 people, interested mm -hmm. in those niche subjects. But honestly, I think that entering politics and taking it seriously is the only answer, mm -hmm. otherwise we're screwed. Well, I think it's a really good way that you say that otherwise we're screwed because to try and bring it back to abortion, um, you do have this social movement that very strongly agitated for legalization of abortion yeah. because in Poland basically all forms of abortion are illegal and people have died and people continue to yeah. die because of lack to, uh, because of no access to um, safe uh, healthcare. Yeah is that this government, this new democratic coalition came to power partially because it promised that it would do something about uh, women's health care. Promised that it's still not delivered. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to get at is, but now it says, oh, we have local elections, you need to wait until after the local elections before we'll do anything, and if we do anything, maybe we'll do a referendum, perhaps the people need to speak. What do you think about that? Because that, to me, sounds very cynical. 
Oh, I mean, I think that this is yet another proof of what I said about, you know, this performative politics. Oh, about, you know, let's wait till the elections. There's always some elections. There's always something that's about to happen in politics. And if there's nothing to happen, then you create something that will happen, right? Uh, European it's elections in uh, June after the local elections. So. There, there are many people, that, uh, many things that I absolutely don't understand about Poland and about world and about politics. And there are two things about Poland that I don't understand. First, how politicians can be so much more conservative than the society is. Because in all the electorates, law and justice is one. And again, this goes co completely against the... Uh, the stereotype that, you know, law and justice voters are just so conservative and, or whatever. Um, no, I think... There's like 70% yeah. of uh, support for liberalization of this current abortion law ban among people who vote for peace. And for other electors, it's like 90%. So, and then you have like three guys in their 50s who just say, no, let's wait to mm -hmm. the elections, right? Same when it comes to same-sex partnerships. Okay, like, of course, still the question of same-sex marriages is a bit tricky because there's like 50% of support, but when it comes to civic partnerships, it's like 70. Mm -hmm. And again, so like society and politics, again, I think that this is something we can all agree with, that politics versus what society wants these days uh, usually are two different things. I don't know what's the situation in Belgium on like particular issues and particular protests. I know that in France it's exactly like that. Yeah, there's a very strong mismatch where it's clear that the power is not centralized. Yeah. Like, it's not to be it's not very general. Yeah, it's not centered at the people. It is in theory, but, like, if there's one thing you can clearly see with those surveys is that there's just such a big mismatch Absolutely. between what most people seem to think and what political leaders do. Yeah. And I, that's why, again, I find it so interesting to see how this is responded to in Poland because it is in my opinion, quite ahead in tackling these questions uh, head on, yep. at least compared to Western European democracies who are, yeah. well, asleep at the wheel. It's yep. just look at what's happening in Italy or in the UK or now in the Netherlands as well, um, where like, the Netherlands surely has become more conservative over time, but still the politicians they elect don't represent the average opinion of people. Do you think maybe that in Poland it's also just because of divisions on like the left that this happens? Because you do have a left-wing coalition, but it actually lost votes at the last election. So another thing that I absolutely cannot understand about Poland is why people don't vote mm -hmm. left, and I generally don't understand. And um, there's unfortunately this kind of libertarian party, Confederacja, the confederation that's um, essentially, you know, let's get rid of any kind of social healthcare system, social security, let's get rid of everything. Uh, let's just leave. We and one of its leaders even uh, argued for the legalization of pedophilia in the last election. So yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, but at that's least quite that, hard for case, yeah. But at so least that showed that there are limits because they yeah. did lose a lot of support after those statements. So thank I God. think that uh, <laughs> child abuse is the only thing that can make a politician everywhere still kind of get exposed and get uh, out of the political scene. This is the only thing these mm -hmm. days. Corruption like some kind of affair, um, misabuse of power, we're so used to that. Only child abuse. Mm -hmm. What does it say about us? I have no idea, but it clearly says something. Well, it does say something, I think, about like the pervasiveness of heteronormativity as well, because there is a certain form of innocence that's projected on children yeah. 
that is really, and I mean this in a political sense, right? I'm not saying that children aren't innocent. <laughs> that would be an interesting position to take. But rather, um, the fact that that's politically abused for whatever, that it really, the rhetoric, I think what I'm trying to yeah. get at, the rhetoric of, you know, I'm doing this for my children, which is used by yeah. every political party, regardless of, you know, their actual stance about yep. children. I mean, uh, the civic platform can argue we're going to cut child benefit, for example, a theoretical example, for our children in the future, and then PIS can say, oh, we are banning abortion because we care about children. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's a twist in when it comes to abortion law of, uh, you know, rights of fetuses, like in Alabama state now. Um, that I think that's a completely different discussion now. So I don't want to enter that and w what this means, actually, because then we will have a conversation about, you know, different subjects. But I, I agree with you and your intuition that Poland actually can can serve as something like as a kind of case study or litmus test for possibly different countries in the closest future. But then what worries me um, is the larger geopolitical situation mm -hmm. because we might have this nice conversation here, but if Donald Trump will become the president Nobody knows what's going to happen. I think that, and this is probably why I say that we would need to, we have to enter politics, because otherwise we are utterly powerless. I don't think that we felt ever this powerless as we feel now when it comes to the plethora of geopolitical consequences of the past 30 years. And I think that entering the politics, and again, this is not a choice that I myself want to make, mm -hmm. because it's dirty, because it's exhausting, because, but probably this is the only choice that people who are serious about changing something, this is the only thing we have, which doesn't really go well with our, you know, notions of self-care and uh, Instagram psychology, and all this therapeutization that we do. Maybe, maybe it doesn't go well, and probably it don't, but I mean, I don't, have, I don't think we have much choice, really. Mm -hmm. But this is being a little bit devil's advocate, of course, but you do choose not to do this. Yeah, I mean, I tried to, so in 2017, after those protests, I create, I, I, I did with two other people that I've met, um, I created this kind of semi-underground congress of these newly emerging political movements mm -hmm. after the, that huge wave of protests. Yes. And that was, from my point of view, I, I, I did that from like purely egoistical reason. I just wanted to know whether there's somebody I could work with. Mm -hmm. and, and how did that experience go then? And that that wasn't that great of an experience. I mean, it was great to meet up. So one of the guys that I've met is the MP now. Another one is... And one for uh, which party, if I may ask? So he, he doesn't belong to any party, yeah. but he has been elected twice now from uh, the civic uh, platform Franek. Franek uh, yeah. Starsh uh, Starshevsky, yes. Yeah. Another guy is... Um, uh, Councillor to the speaker of the lower chamber, mm -hmm. Szymon Hołownia, mm -hmm. and the guy that I co-organized it with is uh, has just started his work for the Ministry of Digitalization yes. and inf Infrastructure and Development. So there are people who do that. I think that while I I might have certain, you know, talents that might serve well. I think I will be destroyed, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I am a better vehicle of those ideas and those issues by public speaking mm -hmm. to other people. 
Yeah, which is fair. I mean, it's a way of I changing the discourse, right? You have to choose your battles. Yes. And you have to pick something that that you will have the biggest influence upon. And I'm good at creating contacts and spreading the news, not least because I'm sporadically funny. <laughs> I, actually, it's good that you... Um, maybe first I will look over here, and I'm sorry, I try not to make, this, uh, make the noise, but it's difficult, apparently. Um, is how much time do we still have? Okay, great. So I wanted to ask, because you talk about like, um, both being funny and creating stuff, is I know that you've created, a f uh, or rather you've uh, been part of the creation of Orlando uh, Biografia. Um, yeah, it's the same in English, or Orlando Biography, right? Um, at uh, Theater Institution in Warsaw, Theater of Szechne. Mm -hmm. um, so is that what you think about then? Uh, one way that you could uh, influence uh, public opinion? Yeah, there's this and there's a uh, mother's song for a wartime with Marta Gurniska yep. yeah. that is like a kind of thing that is at the intersection of choir performance and theater performance with 21 women from Ukraine, Belarus and Poland talking about the civil experience of, of war from female perspective as well. Well, I guess so. I mean, you know, with mothers in particular, like we went... This is like a big co-production. We're going to Avignon in July. We were in Strasbourg. We're in Berlin. Now we're about to go to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be in Utrecht, I think. For a spin uh, festival. I think so, yeah. yes. Um, so, you know, this is, and this is like super powerful performance. Really, it's an hour, but what an hour it is. Like, I don't know how these women who perform do this because it's just, I am exhausted and I worked on it. So I don't know how those performers who talk about their own experiences of, you know, having left their home where they live 60 years. Uh, they talk about their professions, they, about who they miss the most, what they miss the most. Like, that this m makes people think and the same with Orlando, because Orlando... Um, so this is par partly, of course, adaptation of Virginia Woolf's book, but it's also partly based on experiences of trans and non-binary people in, in, in Poland. And we, have, we are blessed with um, participation of the eldest drag queen uh, in Poland on the stage, Lula, who's 85 now, so he remembers the um, Warsaw Uprising of 1944, which is also a part of the spectacle. So I think that, you know, and, and once it, this piece is being played in theater, uh, it's hard to get the tickets for, and this mm -hmm. is like, I've never seen it before, and I'm very happy to have experienced that, that there's standing ovations every time, mm -hmm. which is quite incredible as an experience because people just like it. And yeah, I think I've heard that really this, good things about again, it, yeah. s s spreads some ideas, you know, we didn't have many reviews or like we aren't really being invited abroad, but we do a good work there. Mm -hmm. And I think as a kind of, you know, transmission of ideas, spreading ideas, and not convincing, you know, forcefully anyone to do anything, but rather just making them, th making them Think, you know, I think yes. that what we can do as people who have the mics and have the chance to speak for 30 people, uh, mostly young people, is to kind of, you know, just, just get out of here and just go on Wikipedia and just learn something. Or maybe, you know, send an email to me, Jonas, or, you know, ask about something. Like, if this is something that I can do, I'm, 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 I'm going to be beyond happy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I've, as I said, I've heard really good things about like Khurkobiet, the women's choir. Is I feel it's becoming a bit of an institution at this stage, right? Yeah, it's it really is, yeah. gained a very uh, strong reputation. With, yeah. for example, uh, singing the Polish Constitution, I think yeah. in 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 
and now also with um, like uh, women from Ukraine, Belarus. Are there other uh, countries? Uh, that they... Poland, Belarus, uh, Ukraine. No. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Let me tell you, <laughs> working sure, on sure. three <laughs> languages simultaneously. <laughs> enough. <laughs> that. Um, brings me actually to a, a different thing. Actually, there's several things in here that I would like to ask about. Uh, maybe I'll first ask very shortly about like uh, queer communities in Poland, and then yeah. I would like to move on to like the war in Ukraine, uh, because it's been mentioned several times already, yeah. but I try to keep it a little bit for the end of the discussion, because I know that it's a subject that people have very strong opinions on, uh, including myself. I suspect we're in agreement, <laughs> but... Um, because the reason I bring up Orlando is because, um, as you say yourself, it really is uh, rooted in those queer communities, very local queer communities, actually, like the mm. Warsaw queer community. I'm not saying it's exclusively the Warsaw queer community, of course, but definitely the people we were working with, I would consider people who are you know, influential in the queer community and within arts within Warsaw. Yeah. Um, how was that? A very basic, uh, very basic question. How do you feel uh, as a queer person and as working uh, within a queer community to make these types of performances? Um, how is that experience like? Because in the West, Poland is always um, portrayed as incredibly homophobic and conservative, which is, of course, there's... It's not. It's not true, but there's, there's oh, of course, a basis to it, right? Yeah. The reason, whereas for me, for me, my own coming out was moving to Poland, so yeah. I have a different perspective on yeah. this. Um, how did you experience that? How did you relate to these things? Again, I th I, I, I'm not sure if my experience is representative because I'm, you know, I need to use this fashionable word. I'm very intersectional. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the kind of social ascent that I've experienced and I've been experiencing is quite stratospheric for most of the people. Like I'm in not even in 1% of people from working class who made it. I'm in 1.11001. And and also I know that I perceive things slightly differently because of it and I perceive things differently because I have certain features that make me just care less. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean that I don't experience certain things. Um, I'm not sure to what extent those experiences are very different, like being from a working class part of a capital city in Warsaw and in Paris. Like, honestly, when you go to Saint-Denis in Paris, I'm not sure as a kind of non-white kid who might be queer, I'm not sure if you are in a better position than a Polish person from Tarchomin or from Praga. Mm -hmm. I'd rather say you're in a much worse position. If you are the first generation of immigrants and you're gay, usually you are in a slightly worse position than if you are like rooted enough to have some support system. Mm -hmm. So of course those LGBT free zones were very terrifying and the amount of hate through the public space had been really terrifying also for me, mm -hmm. even if I wasn't there, you know, all of the time, because I'm in between Paris, Warsaw, and elsewhere. Um, but I think that what really homophobia is, is this kind of transparency of experience. It's just assuming that everything works the same way and that uh, we all want say very same things and mm -hmm. I think that this kind of you know assuming that you have a girlfriend and I have a boyfriend is much more that that this is equally and universally difficult like this experience of just being unseen my 
friend who was with me on this picture had had done his coming out in the ripe, ripe age of 35 to so his parents who are from a city that's um, kind of regarded as a quite homophobic, very mm -hmm. kind of peace, like his own father was a leader of the like local um, Rada, I don't know how to like board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Political yeah, like, board of the town. Yeah, like that was um, supported by peace. Could call it city. It's not really city, city council, council but yeah, something similar. Like that, yeah. yeah. And you know, and they love him, and they don't have any problem mm -hmm. with that, and and they got re much closer because of that. Again, well, yeah, no. it's a, f a theme you see reoccurring, right? Is that yeah. it's very easy to demonize a rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as Peace has Tried done very, to, yeah. well, I wouldn't say very successfully, because there's again a divergence there, right? There is a divergence, of course. Like, I, if I remember correctly, I remember seeing opinion polls that suggested that about half of Polish people didn't like LGBT, but then if it was about their own children or just about people in the street, then it was fine, which, you know, is a, it's again classic. a big disconnect, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I think, I think it's that problem that, Essentially, one, once you make people think, they react very differently. Mm -hmm. And when you just ask them general questions like, oh, do you like this? Do you like that? Well, I mean, they can tell whatever. But then also you have to just look at the way how the question was asked, who was asked, when. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite suspicious of those kind of statistics mm -hmm. because I, I'm, my academic mind always is just like, but who asked whom, when, what was the, you know, the amount of people that yeah, were yeah, asked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like statistics are notorious. Have you ever yeah. gotten this phone call from a statistic company? Like, I never got any call from polling company in my mm -hmm. life. And yet, they still claim to, and I don't know anyone who had ever gotten mm -hmm. this call. So. Well, it may also be that, do you answer uh, phone calls from uh, unknown numbers? Yeah. Really? I mean, I'm not that kind of anxious millennial. Okay, I, I am, most definitely. I don't answer if I don't know who it is. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you might find out very interesting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one girl, I think that for two years I had a very regular phone call from an 11-year-old girl oh, wow. that was convinced my name is Paulina yeah. and that I'm not allowing the real Paulina to actually pick up the phone. <laughs> that and was, was like a friend of her then or? Yeah. Like yeah, you, you yeah. presume, I, I guess. Yeah, so I do pick up the, the phone. I hope that little girl has been able to, well, Find little Paulina, 11. I know, me too. Yeah. Um, I will f look again at the organizers. Yeah. Should we move on to questions for the audience? Okay. Okay, so there's one thing that I actually found super interesting that I've heard from several Polish friends, yeah. is that the fact that, I'm not going to ask about the fear because I presume that will come up in, in questions, but is the fact that they are actually a little bit excited about the fact that you now have a lot of Ukrainians who, like it's not a recent thing, but it definitely has intensified since the war, that you just have a lot more Ukrainian people living in Poland. Mm -hmm. They're actually quite excited for like the cultural impact that mm -hmm. is going to have mm -hmm. and that it already mm -hmm. has. And like suddenly um, when you walk around in Warsaw, you'll see a lot more Cyrillic or just Ukrainian uh, signage. Uh, you'll hear more Ukrainian and in general, a society that was very like uh, monolinguistic, very white, very mono, um, mono religious, and so forth, is yeah. really very quickly diversifying. How do you relate uh, to that? Uh, yeah. Do you share that uh, excitement, that optimism? Yes and no. I mean, so before the war, there was between million and million and a half of Ukrainian people that just emigrated for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, after 2022, at this point, it's very difficult actually to tell how many Ukrainian refugees are in Poland, because many of those people travel in between Ukraine yeah, and, and Poland. Yeah, and many have also passed through in Poland. And yeah. yeah, so probably there's an additional 
half of a million. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's not that much, especially in a country that has one of the worst uh, birth rates uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Like we have one of the eldest, like the, the quickest, uh, like the societies that get older the quickest, mm -hmm. along with Italy, I think. Yeah, and probably uh, Germany and South Korea, I think, are also yeah. uh, notorious. So we, n we need each other, you know? Of course, again, as a historian, what World War II did to, to Poland in particular, just m made out of Poland a completely homogenous, mono-ethnic country. Uh, but I think that there are two things. Warsaw and Poland in general has been becoming for quite a few years now just a much more attractive place to live for foreigners. Probably some of you have been to Warsaw already um, or to Kraków or to Wrocław. Um, so there's this thing and this is something that I can see that picked up the pace even since December of last year that now people are, oof, okay, now law and justice is not there, so actually there are companies that, that really kind of sent people to, 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 to Poland just yeah, to work. You can see that there's more an influx of people, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of just people, of yeah. expats, whatever <laughs> that yes. means. Yes, well, it just means rich white immigrants. Yeah, um, nobody cares about rich poor immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Um, and non-white. So, but when it comes to Ukrainian people, I'm worried, frankly, because now polls show pretty high level of anger mm -hmm. and discontent. It is as and if they overstayed yeah. their welcome, something like that. And again, there are people who relate, you know, the kind of crisis of, like the living cost crisis with the war, which is not directly related. It is one of the factors, but it is not mm -hmm. directly related. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite worried about what, what might happen. And if I were to talk to anybody among Polish politicians, I would probably have a a good debate, an open debate about, you know, the participation of Ukrainian mm -hmm. people in the Polish society, because that might just break out in a very random and quite frankly quite unpleasant way at some point. Do you think that, um, that building resentment is also related to the fact that um, a lot of Polish people fear that the war will expand to Poland? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think that there's this like, I don't know, half of a percent maybe. Um, I think that the, the opinion, the, the prevalent opinion is rather than, you know, like that Putin has to be won over mm -hmm. and has to be defeated because otherwise either the Baltic countries or Finland or us will be next. Um, but but I don't think that this is related to that. It's more of a resentment. Oh yeah, we don't have enough, and then there are other people who also need so much from us, but we are not, you know, rich enough or mm. not good enough. So again, it's about inequalities within Poland and about lack of confrontation, like head-on confrontation with actual social issues that are at stake. Mm -hmm. And unless politicians won't do these two things, so talk seriously about the cost of living crisis, uh, talk about uh, young people's mental health, and talk about participation and presence of Ukrainian people in Poland, then something might implode. Mm -hmm. If this will be a proper discussion, if there, there's going to be a proper discussion on this, then we might be good. I can't believe I'm saying this, but we <laughs> might be good, yeah. It's, it's, I think, the most optimistic statement I've heard uh, tonight thus far. 
I'm a historian, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think now, I see yeah. it's uh, 15 past nine, so maybe this is a good moment to uh, open it up uh, for any questions. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Um, I see there's someone over there. And I'm really sorry about this noise. I uh, have a feeling it keeps slipping down. Yeah. I'm very sorry for those who have to listen to this recording because that will be incredibly annoying. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very, very interesting um, lecture and also the conversation. I must confess I don't know that much about Poland. Um, apart from that it's becoming uh, more and more apparent on the radar of people. Um, and that it actually relates to my question. I really find the title interesting, Ascent and Decline of Democracy. And somewhere in your lecture or in the talk, you mentioned that Poland could be an interesting case study for uh, what we perceive Western countries. But the thing is, for a big part of the world, Poland is also considered the West. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, and um, I think I, I hear more and more about people immigrating to Poland, um, uh, whereas uh, before you would think of like the West, it would be Germany, France. And then this brings us to what is being perceived as perhaps the, the biggest uh, challenge of European politics and society, what we call the so-called refugee crisis, but it's really like migration policy issue, uh, which will, um, we have elections coming up in Belgium. This will be where the breaking point, it's already been like with all the pacts that they're making, but Poland is already being uh, on the battlefield of that thing. I recently saw Green Border by Agnieszka Holland, amazing film. Um, so I want to see what is your opinion or how can we look at Poland from that perspective as in maybe also seeing like how, how what to expect for a country like Belgium. I, I think, yeah, I'm very much interested to see how you would perceive that as a challenge to Polish society. Yeah, that's interesting and uh, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, well, for now, the attitude of Poland is not any different than attitude of Greece or Italy or any other kind of border, European border um, country that is being confronted with this, which means it's very cruel policy against refugees. And um, so in 2015, refugees became the, the subject of the political campaign because due to historical issues and due to historical, you know, complexity of, of, of Poland for the past at least 300 years, um, we had been very well received and welcomed in so many places, like there's a Polish village in Iran or in Turkey, there's like, the, again, I could just, you know, talk about it for quite some time here. So the attitude, the initial attitude of people towards refugees wasn't bad. Actually, it was two third people that were uh, for welcoming refugees. And then the political campaign of 2015 took place and the political rhetorics of law and justice won. And those proportions switched. So two thirds of people became absolutely against refugees. And then we have a second act, which is using refugees by Russia and Belarus um, as some kind of, you know, just as an object to create more kind of internal conflicts and also conf more conflicts between the member countries of the European Union. Because what many, many people might not know, essentially, um, 
many people from the nations that, like Afghanistan, for instance, many Afghans through Telegram and other social media uh, were just convinced that there is this agency, that travel agency that just will send people to Minsk in Belarus and that then they will just walk, have a like walk to Poland and then they will be fine. And then hello, it just doesn't look like that. At least, at least people who cross the Mediterranean know the risk. Why with the Eastern European border, nobody knew that they are actually being just a pawn in a larger political, geopolitical game. I think that, again, answer of Poland should not be any different than answer from Italy, Greece, Albania, which means that each and every country that is kind of bordering with non-European country just has to, and also that we have to have a collective conversation and honest conversation about the climate refugees and about any war refugees. I mean, it's obvious that Europe is not relevant anymore. Europe is old. Europe has all this, you know, all this um, wealth and none of the influence. Like, we are really, we aren't powerful. So maybe instead of just denying this, let's just maybe try to recreate our continent and have a conversation about what it means to be European these days. I mean, Ghent, for instance, this city is a perfect example on how a place can be reinvented, right? From Middle Ages, prosperity, then 19th century factories. Uh, now, this is a university city. Like, it's a good example. So I think, I think that, again, the problem can be put down to a lack of honest conversation. And this subject is also kind of being put, you know, uh, outside of a media conversation in Poland. And there's just like a group of, you know, crazy people who uh, help refugees. And then there's the rest that just doesn't want to know anything. But we will all know about it. Like in Paris, for instance, now, before the Olympics, the uh, city is um, regularly cleaning out the um, people without SDF, uh, son domicile uh, fixe, so like mm -hmm. homeless people, homeless people. Uh, to the outskirts of, of Paris. And my, my flatmate is a part of an association that works to help refugees. There's hundreds of people between 13 to 17 sleeping on the streets of Paris alone. We had hosted a guy who was sent by his father from Sierra Leone, I think, or from Ivory Coast, 13 year old, sent by on a boat through the Mediterranean to France. What for? He was just sent. And it's on us. I mean, it's too late. So you're going to send them back. Just, just let's try to give these people some future. Jesus, like it's not that. It's not that difficult. It's difficult for us once we enter this kind of, you know, institutional. Oh, it's so complicated level. And the simple truth is, oh, Olympics. It's optics. Optics of the Olympics. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, good luck with the public transportation in Paris. And I mean, I'm very Parisian now because I'm very against this whole circus. But yeah, it's going to be very funny to be there. I'm going to uh, maybe ask, are there any um, other questions right now? Yes. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, so um, I'm half Polish, and when I speak to my friends, um, they they feel, for example, in their families that there is a very big division, right? I think it's probably comparable to what happens happens in the States, right? That you just have a lot of fights um, at the dinner table with your family. Uh, 
is there a solution <laughs> at the horizon or will it only get worse? Or do you feel, it sh well, probably it's too early, but do you feel a shift in, in that divide or is it just not, is it not possible to cross anymore between those two? Uh, you know, again, maybe I'm just like a silly optimist deep down, despite all the doom and gloom that I was talking about. Because, I mean, I think that we always can find something, you know, like some kind of baseline that we can all agree on, that we care about the same things in different ways. Well, I mean, I can't talk about it from first-hand experience because I'm, this is probably the only thing that me and my family align with 100% and it's been always this way and I think like I owe a lot in my family and to my family to this kind of political conversations and the fact that politics was always very commented upon in my family. Mm. From what I know, those divisions are really deep and it reached a point where people stopped talking to one another because there's nothing to talk about. Can Again, you I think, think that can be solved? Like, the way, is, is there a way to reconnect, you think? Because I think that's what the question was kind yeah, of getting at. I think, I mean, it all depends, doesn't it? It all depends on what was said whether actually this is maybe a symptom of a different problem between the family system, because maybe it's not about that, maybe it's about something completely else mm -hmm. that is not being addressed. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a therapist, so I can't say really, <laughs> but... Um, well, you do know Instagram psychology, so... <laughs> <laughs> do I like it, though? Um, I like memes, not psychology. Uh, this is the best therapy. I think, I think th the best you can try is to just look for what brings you together. I think with problem in many Polish families, and maybe just in many families, is that we just fake closeness. That we fake that we like each other while loving each other and liking each other, these are two different things. And I think that we just have to start looking at each other. Okay, do we want to spend time together? Because if not, let's just, you know, part in peace. But if you really want to be a family, maybe let's try to find a way to like each other. And I think that this is a good starting point, to try to like each other just as a person that's that you would meet somewhere else and just try to see them as a human, not as your mother or as a, an annoying uncle. I mean, there's a certain category of uncles that there's no hope for, we all know those uncles. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it. This is just a very small interlude, but I was recently reading the new biography of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And I'm not joking now, but what you l just said about loving and liking is not the same as at the very core of what he was saying. So I'm guessing that it's a very, you know, has a strong pedigree. Okay, okay. Uh, nobody has read anything by Mahatma Gandhi here recently, well, right? He was influenced by Gandhi, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Let's just like each other, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's just... Yeah, maybe this is also um, a very kind of uh, subversive um, end of our uh, Orlando biographies, that actually we should have a party, because party and actually celebration and embracing joy can bring us much more closeness mm -hmm. sometimes than just this kind of conversation that we just had. Uh, so maybe let's just all have party and let's just organize a party for our uncles mm -hmm. and parents. Well, <laughs> I think that's a really good thing to, to end this uh, discussion. Politics with. and parties. This exactly. is the name of a new political <laughs> movement in Europe. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, being here with us today thank and you. for uh, giving this really interesting and inspiring lecture. And uh, yeah, I hope for the audience it was also interesting and that... Uh,
you learned. Uh, well, I think there's a lot of stuff you will have learned tonight. Um, thank you for staying. <laughs> yes, thank you all for staying, and I wish you all a very good evening.